Okay, hi everybody. Welcome back. Today we've got Banksa Holdings. You know them well, uh, but if you need a reminder, the ticker in Canada is BNXA. For our American friends, it's BNXAF. Now, today we're really lucky. We have back in the studio, we got Dom Carroza, the founder and chairman. Dom, how are you? Uh, fantastic. And uh, yourself, Kevin? Always good. Always good. It's, it's fun having our chats. I was looking forward to this one. So you are familiar with the company. In case you do need a reminder, we'll be sure to link uh, to our first video where it was more of an overview of the company. But for today, we're just going to dive straight into the questions. So, John, without further ado, let's get into it. Um, first question that I have for you. What's your strategy and roadmap at a high level for the next year? Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe before I answer that question, just to kind of paint the, the picture. Um, you know, notwithstanding the the turbulence in the in the crypto markets and you know prices going up and down, um, you know we're big believers of blockchain technology and everything that basically is built on top of the blockchain. Whether it's you know Bitcoin and Ethereum, NFTs, um, blockchain gaming. Uh, so you know, first and foremost, we are believers in this whole ecosystem. That that's sort of point number one. Point number two is most people today still live what we call in the fiat world, you know, the US, Canadian, Euro, dollar world. And hence the requirement for what we call the the on-ramps and the off-ramps, basically the connection between the fiat world and the digital asset world um, will only become even more important over the next six to 12 months. So just to, I want to provide a, just a bit of context around you know the market and and really how we see it at a at a, at a high level. Then when it, I go into the banks' strategy over the next six to twelve months, you know what can you expect from us as a company? Um, first and foremost, uh, adding many more local payment methods. Uh, and you may ask, well, why are they actually important? Local payment methods are faster and cheaper and have a higher conversion rate than credit card. Most of our competitors in the space uh, offer credit card. We obviously offer credit card as well, but having a local payment like ACH in the US, Interact in Canada, Poly in Australia is faster and cheaper, not only for our customers, but our customer's customer. Uh, The conversion rates are materially higher um, so, and it's harder to do, and I'll talk about why it's harder to do, and why we've decided to go, you know, take the the long approach, but the m- more importantly, the better approach. Second of all, licensing. Um, we know that the crypto industry is only becoming more and more regulated, and hence, as it becomes more regulated, there is a greater requirement to have what is called VASP, Virtual Asset Service Provider Licenses. They effectively allow us to operate legally in in each of those key countries and so we have already acquired a number of licenses and we will continue to do so as we've announced to the market recently you know this is hard to do and just to give you some context one of our last licenses from the dmb the dutch national bank that was a a 12 to 18 month process now it's a long and costly process but it's absolutely important um, and at the same time, we've also announced uh, moving into LATAM. Uh, we've just launched Brazil with a local payment network called PIX. Um, we've got our eye on Turkey, UK, uh, and a number of other emerging markets. So you're going to see much more happening in these markets. And then we're also making investments into um, our marketing communication strategy. We've just hired a new CMO. Uh, you'll, if you go to our website, you will notice repositioning and rebranding. And we're going to start doing much more investor relations. Uh, in fact, uh, next week, I'm off to uh, the HC Wainwright Conference. Uh, the week after that, the LD Micro Conference. So we're, now that I guess COVID is over to a degree, um, we can actually go out there and start talking about uh, the company because frankly, most investors have never heard of Banksa before. Hence, that's the opportunity. Certainly. So, um, what uh, in particular, what partnerships are you most excited about, and and what are some of the reasons for it? Uh, you know, in terms of partners, um, you know, we've just recently launched uh, NFT Cash to NFT. Just coming back to the whole notion of products that are built on top of the the blockchain. You know, NFTs, non fungible tokens, are a significant 
opportunity for us. Right now, if anyone uh, watching has actually tried to buy an NFT, there are multiple hops. You, know, you either buy Bitcoin or Ethereum and you got to work out is it on the Ethereum network or Solana or Polkadot. Um, and then there's like three or four different hops. You, you have enough there for gas fees. And then you got to go and try and buy on, on a, a site like uh, OpenSea. And so what we've done at Banksa is really simplified that whole process. And so we can go straight from cash into an NFT without a consumer having to be a technical genius. Uh, you know, and that's really part of our, our value proposition. And you know, we've uh, formed a relationship with Atomi. Um, we've also formed an Atomi uh, relationship with Hedera. So we're really adding these partners, uh, and, you know, commercial partners, uh, to, with regards to, to Banksa and everything that we do. And uh, what about Nor North America? What's the company's plan for, uh, let's say, North American penetration? Uh, the US market uh, is a very, very important market for us. In, fa in fact, it's the biggest market in the world. Um, we have already started the process uh, in the US in order to be able to operate there effectively and, and legally. Uh, you need to have what is called MTLs, Money Transmitter Licenses. It's similar to what I was talking about before with regards to VASPs, Virtual Asset Service Provider Licenses. In the US, they're called MTLs. Uh, and so we've already started that process. It's important for a number of reasons. One is significant growth reasons, uh, as well as cost saving reasons. By actually having our own MTLs, uh, we can effectively go direct uh, and, and ultimately offer a greater variety of coins across small blockchains to customers in a more cost-effective manner. Yeah, I agree. That certainly makes sense. And you alluded to this um, earlier a little bit, but perhaps let's elaborate. So how would, how would management uh, support the stock and demonstrate overall confidence in the stock? Yeah, that's a, a, a very, um, very good question. So, you know, management to date, um, if you take the last... Uh, calendar year 2021, you know, a number of management actually bought into the company. Uh, so that's kind of like one uh, one bucket. And the other is just becoming much more visible out in the marketplace. Uh, for example, there's a big trade show called Consensus. Um, think of it as like the, the mecca for everything blockchain and everything crypto. You know, we've actually got our stand there. It's really the first major trade show in the last you know, a couple of years post COVID, where we've actually had a physical stand and, and uh, our team will be there really promoting banks, uh, signing up partners and really uh, gearing up for the future. And so it's exciting to have live events uh, back in action. So you, you must be excited for that. What city is uh, Consensus in this year? Uh, it's in Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. So, okay, so we've, we've discussed a couple things. Um, you mentioned an increasing focus on investor relations, investor awareness. So um, let's jump a little more into what marketing efforts uh, management is going to make to to bring more investor awareness to the stock. You, you mentioned a few, certainly, but are there any others? Um, so we're, we've just brought on board a, a new CMO uh, as well, who's doing all the things that a new CMO should do in terms of the company branding and positioning and getting us out there from a business perspective. Part of his remit is also from an investor relations perspective, so doing much more activity uh, from a uh, from an IR. Uh, but you know, I think all of that is great, and I think that is really important as a public company because we need to obviously promote ourselves to investors. But I think at the same time, you know, coming from a product perspective. Um, you know, part of our, I guess, value proposition to our customers is to have the best possible product and to have the best possible experience. Because if we do that, um, you know, then the business comes, the revenue comes, the profit ultimately comes, and, and then that's a, the benefit to investors. Um, you know, I guess one, one of the things that we're, you know, looking at just sort of to jump back to product, because I think products really important you know what what are we doing and what are some of the sort of big opportunities in the space and particularly with the industry being you know a bit of flux and there's been some you know d declines in uh the price of bitcoin and, and other coins um we had sell so what is called off-ramping the ability for you as a customer to take your bitcoin and sell it into cash we're now effectively relaunching this product because what we've seen with this heightened um, you know, volatility in the space, there's been even more demand for off-ramping or what is called sell. 
And so what you're going to see from banks are an ability to go not just from Bitcoin and Ethereum, but to go from stable coins and some of these other coins into not just the US dollar and Euro and Canadian dollar, but to a whole host of other currencies. So that's you know one big major product innovation. Two is um, KYB. Um, so today we only service individual customers. So natural persons as they're called. So we do things like KYC, know your customer. Um, we're just about to implement KYB, know your business. So we can now onboard institutions and businesses and family offices. So this is a, a part of the market that we haven't been able to target. Um, and I think over the next couple of quarters and the next couple of halves, you're gonna see much more activity uh, in that institutional space. You know, and they're the guys that are able to write, you know, not, not just five or 10 grand type checks, but 50, 100, couple of hundred grand, a couple of million dollar type checks when onboarding. So we see this as a significant opportunity. Um, and then obviously adding new payment methods, you know, I've spoken about Brazil and Turkey um, and a number of other new emerging markets. And, and then obviously the NFT checkout, you know, the single one click checkout and go from credit card, local payment method, straight into an NFT without having to be a technical genius. Personally, very interested in the the NFT aspect because I know <laughs> how tricky and uh, how many steps are involved in that. Um, and good timing with the institutional uh, aspect. I wish I had the, the stat off the top of my head. I just read that, well, for one, at the Miami Bitcoin conference, they had an entire day that was dedicated to institutions only and it was sold out. So that was something new and notable. Um, but also in the kind of turmoil that's happened over the last, let's just say, few weeks. Um, and I don't have the stat on me, but it was a substantial, <clears throat> substantial amount of institutional buying coming out of that. So so your timing, I think, makes perfect sense, at least from what I'm seeing. Yeah. It, 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 so, so I was going to say it's quite interesting. So. If you go back to 2017, you know, and the height of Bitcoin up to 20 grand, that was mainly driven by consumers. Um, and what we've really started to see, really from about end of 2018, early 2019, many more institutions, corporates, family offices are now moving into into the space. And in the last really four or five weeks, you've seen a lot of retail sell down, which is why we, we're turning on and expanding our sell function. You go from crypto to fiat money because people got to pay their mortgages, they got to pay their bills, and so they're selling some crypto. But more importantly, and this is where I think we're going to be able to have a, a big impact on our transaction volume, is opening up to companies, you know, to institutions. Uh, and we know talking to some of our exchange partners, between 30 to 50% of all of their volume is that institutional business market which up to date we haven't been able to access from a banks perspective. Now we're gonna be able to access those customers. Uh, so I think that's where we're gonna actually see some really strong volumes coming through over the next six to 12 months. <clears throat> Certainly. Um, something else <clears throat> I wanted to discuss was a bit about competition. So um, <clears throat> how do you feel about competitors in the market or other companies, you know, quote unquote, eating your lunch? Um, I think ultimately it's a love-hate relationship. Um, competition helps drive us harder and us faster and ultimately provides a better quality product and a better quality experience to our customers. Um, you know, and I think one of the things that, you know, sort of we've learned in the space, it's very dynamic. Um, and, you know, in some cases, you know, our competition has done better than we have in certain key areas. In other areas, we've done better than some of our competition. So it's just one of those things. It's like, a, um, you know, trying to sort of like push, push and just trying to learn um, and out and out bid. Because, you know, I guess you, you can kind of take the analogy of a, of a capitalist corporate type country versus a, a more socialist a communist type country, you know, competition is, I think, great for business and ultimately great for consumers. Certainly, I'd, I'd agree with that. And uh, <clears throat> so for my last question for you, uh, something I wanted to discuss and, and dig into a little bit is that, so in spite of, you know, you are adding new, comp uh, sorry, new partners. However, I have seen the, the TTV declining. So maybe just a, a quick little refresher for anyone who's not entirely familiar with the, the acronym TTV. And then let's talk a little bit about why it has declined in spite of adding new partners. Yeah. Um, so TTV is total transaction value. It's one of the measures that we communicate to the marketplace around how the company's going. What are the measures? There's TTV, total transaction value. Um, 
there's revenue, which obviously TTV percentage that translates into revenue. And then there's obviously gross margin or GP. And then obviously everything below that are, are SG&A and, and employee costs. Um, with the, let's call it the, the, the I want to just say the turmoil, the changes in the marketplace, you know, what we've seen, and, you, and just to maybe take a step back, you may ask, what actually drives our TTV? I think there are, there's a, not just one, there's a number of factors. One is the price of Bitcoin. Obviously, the high, higher the price of Bitcoin, the higher the TTV. I mean, that's pretty logical. Um, two is what is the volatility in the marketplace? And, and let me just give you an example. So last year, Bitcoin was trading in a very narrow band. And, and basically what happened was, you know, our, for that quarter, well, I think it was a September quarter, our TTVs dropped from the June quarter because Bitcoin volatility wasn't particularly high. Then what we saw towards the end of last calendar year, there were big swings in terms of the price of Bitcoin and our TTV was higher uh, because people will either buy the dip or the, as the Bitcoin price is going up, they'll basically want to not miss out. You know, there's the sort of FOMO aspect. Um, and then there's also the, the other point, so there's sort of three points, uh, is the ex volume at the exchanges. So when the volume of the exchanges declines, that has a direct impact to us because we're connected in the exchanges. So, you know, so just to kind of recap, it's the price of Bitcoin, it's the volatility of Bitcoin, and it's the volume at the exchanges. And just to sort of give a sense, and I don't want to sort of um, you know, forecast what our main numbers will be other than saying, um, May, sorry, in April, wasn't a huge amount of volatility and we released our, our numbers. May, huge amount of volatility in, in the Bitcoin price, like swings of five to 10% uh, in a day or sometimes just even hours. That will be reflected in our numbers that we release for May. Uh, as in in a positive way, I higher than the month before. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's just kind of like just trying to give you know viewers a bit of a sense of, of TTV. But if you take a, a long term view, what do we need to do? Add more customers, add more coins, add more payment methods, add more um, licenses. Well, it sounds like you've got a big uh, year coming up. So lots of exciting interviews that I'm looking forward to following along with, with this story. Congrats on everything you've achieved to, to, to date. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to keep following along for the rest of the remainder of the year. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. And, you know, we've got a, a great team. Uh, we've got a, a great number of loyal uh, investors and customers. And we're just going to continue you know, building the business doing, and doing the best that we can. That's all you can do. And... Uh, <clears throat> So for those of you watching, I imagine you're going to have some questions. Reach out to us. We'd be delighted to answer them. We're going to have Dominic back again. Uh, like I said, if you need a refresher, we're going to send a link to the first video where it was more of an introductory uh, video about Banksa. As a reminder, for Canadians trading on the in the sorry, trading on our local markets, BNXA, and in the US, BNXAF. So for now, Dom, thank you so much, and I can't wait to do this again. Fantastic. Thanks, Kevin. And what I'd say is follow Banks are on Twitter. Um, we That's the other thing that I just should have mentioned is we will announce a lot of our partners on Twitter that we don't announce through the stock exchange because literally we can't announce a, a new deal every couple of days. So just watch Twitter and, and you'll actually see the activity coming through that, uh, which is once again, what a lot of US NASDAQ and NYSE companies do. So hopefully investors can kind of see, you know, we're trying to grow as an organization. And uh, Kevin, once again, thanks for having me on the program. My pleasure. And we'll be sure to link your Twitter below. Uh, I know you guys are very active. So yeah, I'd mimic, I'd echo that. Be sure to go check them out.